Good afternoon, my name is Kelly Nichaporek. I'm the Environmental Program Manager with Lakeland Agricultural Research Association. Welcome to our 2022 agronomy update. Hopefully this will help you find the direction that you wanna, what you wanna grow this year and make your uh, plant 22 plans a little bit easier. Uh, we have a great lineup of speakers and our first one is Shelley Barkley. Shelley has had a variety of positions within her career from pest control officer for the town of Stettler to manager of the garden center. In 1993, she joined Alberta Agriculture as the information officer at the Crop Diversification Center South. Answering gardening calls from all over the province honed her insect and disease diagnostic skills. In 2008, the opportunity to work with Scott Mears, insect management specialist with Alberta Agriculture materialized and she leapt at it. The learning curve has been steep, but the job is never dull and the people involved in the industry are great. When Scott retired in 2020, Shelley remained in the program and has been responsible for managing and completing the insect surveys for the last two years. When Shelley is not sweeping canola, washing soil, or pinning insects, her passions are photography, swimming, and quilting. So, I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you. We'll just get, share my screen. We'll see if I, uh, there we go. Okay. Like, uh, all right. So thank you for that uh, great introduction. And I'm really thrilled to be talking about one of my passions of the results of our insect surveys for uh, 2021. I'm probably not going to say anything that people don't already know from being in their fields and just being in the environment last year. But maybe you never know. There's always surprises. Let's see. Okay, so first thing I'd like to say is thank you to Kelly and, and Amanda and the folks at Lara for all the work they do in doing our insect surveys for us. Um, these guys are responsible for uh, uh, St. Paul, Lac La Biche and Bonneville municipalities. And what this does is it frees me up to do um, municipalities that don't necessarily have the luxury of having an ARA. This program is responsible for insect surveys from the US border all the way up to Fort Vermilion. And so I make about two or three trips, well, yeah, two or three trips through the province every year. And in 2021, I went three quarters of the way around the world doing insect surveys. So having someone in Fort Vermilion and having someone in Bonneville who are able to do the insect surveys just makes it much more powerful for us to get our results. So I, I just couldn't do it without these guys helping me out. So that's, that's really important. First thing up, we're gonna talk about grasshoppers and um, probably one of the most <laughs> hated insects in uh, agricultural systems, I'm sure. So this map is a, a picture in time from August 2020 and it gives you an idea of sort of what we were looking at going into 2021 in the grasshopper front. And I have to say there's about 2200 lines of data that goes into building this map and all that information is captured by the um, agricultural fieldmen of the province. So everywhere where there's agriculture practiced in, in municipalities, the folks from the Ag Service Boards are out there counting grasshoppers. So 2,200 lines of data means 2,200 stops in each and every corner of the province. And so this is a very powerful survey and lets us know sort of um, what's going on on the grasshopper front. And it's probably the longest running um, survey that we uh, manage for the province. So you can see that, um, you know, the grasshoppers weren't really an issue and in, in forecasted to be an issue in 2021. And we had such a great year for grasshoppers. It was dry and it was really warm. And so this is what the same period of time in 2022, 2021 looks like. So we're, we're in a risk range in some places that uh, are looking at uh, having quite a, an outbreak of grasshoppers. Like yesterday I was in Oyen and um, things are, could be bad there um, depending on the weather and depending on the grasshopper emergence. 
in in Bonneville and and in Lara's country, not maybe quite so much, but there is some um, grasshopper activity going on. Realize that 2021, the heat is really favored grasshopper um, population, as well as the um, long fall. They were able to lay eggs for a long time in the fall, and so. Uh, we have quite a potential in the ground for some issues. So if it remains hot and dry, we could see some, some grasshoppers, maybe not so much up in the Northeast, but for sure in um, the south, Southern part of the province and on the Eastern side of the province. So all I can suggest is that if when you were out in the fields last, last summer or last late last summer combining and you noticed a lot of grasshopper activity that's where I would go back to in June and start walking the edge and and checking to make sure that your grasshoppers are below economic threshold they're easier to deal with when they're little um, they can't run away from you quite as easy and they can't fly and so um, that's uh, the best time to go and look for them and and do any treatment options if you have to. Now, June has 30 days. So when in that 30 days should you be out looking? Well, it's hard, to, you, it's hard for me to tell you that, but you can sign up for this great little news uh, letter um, that is delivered to your email box from the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network. And that little email actually has um, insect development maps in it, and as well as other um, information that farmers would find useful, but they take the information of where the grasshopper was at development wise in the fall, mix that in with uh, growing degree days, and they're able to predict when grasshoppers will be emerging from the ground. And so that will help you to understand when you should be out looking for them. So that's a great little tool to sign up for, and we'll talk about it again a little later. Flea beetles, there was a lot of flea beetles last uh, July and August, at least in, in some of the fields I was in. And farmers actually had to make some hard decisions um, around flea beetles. They were eating the pods. And so uh, farmers say in the Peace and in Southern Alberta for sure made, made the hard decision and, and went out and sprayed in some cases. That spray was to protect the yield that was there. It was not as, a, as an action for preventing a spring infestation. So that population that we saw in um, last summer will be the population that is all snuggled up, all nice and warm under the grass and un, in tree groves and under shelter belts and now under a nice blanket of snow, getting ready, just, just hanging out having a hibernation period. They will come out in the spring and I've collected them here at Brooks as, as almost as soon as the snow has melted and it's about 10 degrees C. They're out and actively feeding on, on um, crucifer weeds like stinkweed. And then once your canola comes up, they can move into the canola and they're very mobile. That's, uh, they can fly a fair ways. So I've collected them at Brooks and canola, the closest brassica or, or cruciferous crop has been about five miles away. So yeah, they can get around quite easily. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to make sure that you're out scouting that small canola when it's coming through the ground and at the cotyledon stage. So here's a great little tool that's uh, on the Canola Council of Canada's webpage. And it, it shows you different percentages of feeding damage on your cotyledons. And so armed with this, you know what 25% of damage looks like to your leaves of your canola. And this is your action threshold. And this will be when you pull the trigger and decide to spray or not. Um, know that the striped flea beetle will actually uh, drop underneath the plant and feed on the stems when we have those days when it's not quite so pleasant in the spring. I've been told by people who are really smart at this entomology game that you need to, you may need to be visiting those canola fields um, almost daily during the uh, cotyledon stage to, if the weather is that uh, hot and dry and they, and your canola plants aren't actively growing and, and can grow out of the, um, 
cotyledon stage. So it's worthwhile keeping your eye out. We have large populations in the province. Whether they were successful overwintering, a lot of stuff can happen between now and when the canola comes out of the ground. But know that um, it's something you want to want to keep an eye on. And this is the striped flea beetle damage. And you can see it gets underneath the leaves and chomps on the stem. And when it chomps on that stem, that's it. Because it, it, that stem is so fine at this stage that the chomp is like halfway through. And that's, that usually finishes off your canola. Um, so the insect management specialist in Manitoba, in Saskatchewan, as well as Jennifer Otani in the Peach is all recommending that we be on the lookout for um, cutworms. We've had, uh, again, a really nice long fall with a lot of regrowth in the fields. And this sets us up for um, cutworm infestation. So it's important for you to be ready to be out if you're driving by your crop and you see that or visiting your crop and you see that spot where there was crop a couple days ago and now it's gone, it's important to get out and, and check that interface from where the crop is no longer to where the crop is and dig around in there and see if you can find cutworms. So I am actually a visual and hands-on learner. So the week of Good Friday in April of 2019, we were called to this beat field in southern Alberta. It was a winter wheat field and the crop had just kind of disappeared. So we walked the field and when we came to this interface where you see that little bit of green grass that's or green wheat that's left, um, we found little black, we found black worms. These are, were not cutworms, but they're in the same family as cutworms. So they're, they act the same as cutworms. It's called um, a tiger moth. And normally tiger moths are pests, uh, or not pests, but live in native rangeland. There was rangeland just beyond the hill there on the other side of the fence of this field. And so when the moths flew in the fall of 2018, they saw this wonderful wheat field and they just laid their eggs there. And so there was a large, huge population and the wheat disappeared there was 5% left of the field by the time somebody noticed there was a problem. And so here's the thing, the, the weather in that particular time in spring was not great. It was kind of cool and, and it, it led you to believe that there was not much left, there was not much in your fields that would be out eating. Insects wouldn't be there, it wasn't very nice out. Well, it wasn't very nice out for humans, but down on the ground where these things were living and eating, it was warm. They were out of the wind. They were getting some reflected heat off, this, off the ground. And so they were there eating. So the message is that, you know, you need to be checking, even if the weather doesn't feel good where our heads are at, at five feet and above, um, sometimes things are going on in the field when it's cool and nasty. So that was that lesson. Here's a great little resource that you can download from the Ag Canada website. And um, it's in both official languages and you can store it on your, uh, your tablets, on your phone, on your computer. And it tells you, you know, the cutworm, it tells you what stage it will be at in any particular month. So it'll, if it overwinters as a larva, that tells you that. And so this is all key to how you manage this pest in your, in your field. And it also talks a little bit about its preferred host. So a great resource to have on hand for sure. So this is a cutworm that we all are very familiar with. This is a climbing cutworm. This is Bertha armyworm. And uh, these, these were almost full grown larvae and it was the end of July in Southern Alberta. Anyways, just, been, just to make note that they're not always black with that yellow racing stripe. We run a, a monitoring system in the province of three, last year it was 337 traps. Lara manages two or three of these traps for us in the area of, uh, in their area, which is really great because it allows producers to know the threat of birth to army worm in season. So, Traps go up in, in early, 
in early June and will remain up for six weeks. So that takes us through the summer to the first part of August. And weekly, people go to these traps. There's about 100 um, cooperators that will go to their traps, count the moths, and then they put their trap results into a web-based app where that creates a map. And this is this would have, is an example of the online map from 2021, and um, it is a rolling total for those months, and it allows us to know when the peak flight of Bertha Army where moths are. So it allows us to know when to go out and do some scouting for the larvae in our fields. Now, and you can find this on our web page, and I'll show you how to get there in a minute. Um, Producers of not only just canola, but faba beans, peas, flax. Um, we've even had reports of them eating uh, potato and quinoa are gonna wanna pay attention to these maps because I've been called out to fields where Bertha armyworm is eating into the pod of faba bean and eating all the goodness out of the seed and just leaving the outside of the, of the seed left behind. So, um, Everybody has some skin in this game because Bertha can be bad in any of these crops. So we take that data from all those traps and we um, smooth it out into this map. And you can see that um, Bertha armyworm was not an issue in 2021 in Alberta. There was some brewing happening between Red Deer and Edmonton and in that vicinity, but that population just totally just disappeared. Um, there was two traps that just went over that 300 zone. In, there was less than 350 moths cumulative in those traps. So Bertha is probably not gonna be a problem for us in 2022. But that being said, you can just go to the website and check our map and you will know whether you need to be out scouting or not. And so this is how you get there. Um, I would uh, just Google Alberta Pest Monitoring Network. You go down to the little tab that says view survey results, and then you can go to the live feed maps, and you can see the maps we offer that are live feed, and um, just click on Bertha, and then you can zoom it in and out for your area, and you will know sort of that, that Bertha's around or that Bertha's not a problem. Then on the other side of that page there, you can see that's where the annual maps and surveys are. So once we get the smooth map made for the grasshopper survey or the pea leaf weevil survey, that information is all posted there with a interpretation of what we're seeing and, and that helps um, uh, you to know what's coming at you. Uh, another one that, that uh, um, could be a problem um, in your area because you guys tend to get regular rain there um, would be wheat midge and wheat midge um, will go up she emerges about the time your wheat is in anthesis starting at boot crack and will go up and down those heads looking for a great place to lay her egg and she'll do that in between the gloom and right on the seed which is hardly a seed at that point and the egg hatches into this orange little maggot that you see right here. Now, um, I've seen as much as, as many as five of these little maggots on this uh, kernel. And when you get that many, they suck the life out of the kernel and it often goes out the back of the combine and you, and you don't know that uh, you've had midge damage. Sometimes when you take your grain to the elevator, uh, the elevator guy will tell you that you've had frost damage on your on your wheat and you, and you know that you haven't, then it could have been some midge um, feeding damage for sure. This is the midge forecast map for 2022. Um, it looks like we are not going to have much of a wheat midge issue uh, for 2022. Uh, the hot spot is in that cameras cunt. Camrose County area, and it and they must have had some rains that we didn't get uh, for the rest of the province because they were um, the places that I found midge when I was washing the soil. 
now. I say that we may not have, that we probably won't have Midge, but realize that wheat midge also has this capability of remaining in the soil as a pre-cocoon for another season until they get June rains, because that's what brings them on and brings them out into, forces them to pupate and brings them out. So if we didn't get a rain in June, if there was a latent population there, they still could be in the soil and could be there ready to come out. Now, so we all, we go out and we collect soil samples. Last year, uh, we collected 290 soil samples from across the province. Lara took some um, and other ARAs and some of the counties take some and uh, I take the rest. And then it all comes to Brooks and I spend a month washing soil and I wash the soil, float these things out and take them up under a microscope. These are the pre-cocoons of wheat midge. And under the microscope, I do a really um, scientific thing called dissection where I take two <laughs> doll making pins and I pull apart these larvae in these sacs and I get this little guy. This is the larva of um, macroglans, which is a parasitoid of wheat midge. And when I, so when you see our wheat midge map, that takes into account how much, how many parasitoids um, were in the sample as well. And there's often only one parasitoid. There is only one parasitoid in each midge larvae. And what happens is that the female um, parasitoid walks up and down the head after the wheat midge, and she uh, will lay her eggs inside the egg of the wheat midge larvae and that they will develop together. And when it comes time to pupate in June, that's when the, the parasitoid kills the wheat midge. And that's what the wasp looks like. That's how big she is. She's pretty tiny, but she uses those antenna and she just finds those eggs underneath the, uh, the glooms of the wheat. Now, so I said we're probably not in a wheat midge situation, but you know, it never hurts to go out and look. And so you can go out to your wheat fields uh, after supper when the air temperature has made that shift at night. So it's been hot all day. And then at night you feel that coolness come on. That's when wheat midge will come up out of the canopy. She's down low in the ground because if they're up during the heat of the day, they'll just dry out and disappear. So once it cools off at night, they come up and they're working on the heads. So if you take a sweep net out and make 10 sweeps in your field um, in one spot and look and see if you find any of those little orange um, mosquito-like things, um, then you'll know that you may need to just take a breath stop for a while and watch the heads and count the number of wheat midge on the heads and then make your decisions according to your economic thresholds. And when you open up that sweet net, if you see little black specks that are, look like popcorn in your sweet net, it'll be the parasitoid in the, in the sweet net as well. So probably sweeping about six spots in the field will give you an idea if you have wheat midge in there. If you don't find any midge in the sweet net, it's time to roll on to the next field. So when I asked about sort of what um, you were interested in, um, Amanda said to me, pea leaf weevil. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about pea leaf weevil. This was a few years ago on the banks of the Red Deer River in Nehill County. And um, this was when we, uh, pea leaf weevil damage was really bad. And it took us a long time to evaluate peas in, in the field. So there's a lot of notching and feeding going on there for sure. But you can see by this, by our, our temporary map here that we didn't find a whole lot of feeding up in your necks of the woods, zero to 1% notching. And um, in my experience of surveying pea leaf weevil in, in Bonneville and St. Paul, um, that has typically been the find. There has never been um, finds where we're kind of alarmed 
uh, we're always finding maybe one or two notches in 50 plants on on plants that are at the four or five or six node stage so pea leaf weevil isn't here at damaging levels but it's a good thing to to understand how the insect works so that you can be prepared for it when you come along in uh 2021 thank goodness lara came along and they they did the pea leaf weevil survey in your counties for 2021. So this is sort of how the animal works. It's in the, uh, it's right now, it's in hayfield, alfalfa hayfields or ditches with alfalfa overwintering. And um, when, the, so when the air temperature comes to go, you know, eight, nine, 10 degrees C, it comes out and it's feeding on the alfalfa. And then when it gets warm and your peas are up, so now we're talking about, you know, 20, um, they will move into the pea fields. And that's when they'll start feeding on peas. They can feed on several hosts, but they can only complete their life cycle on faba beans and peas. So they can't reproduce on anything else. So now she moved, they move into the pea fields, they mate, and she start, they start eating. The, the female loses her ability to fly. She, she, her body reabsorbs her wings and that helps to her to lay her eggs, um, gives her a little bit more added um, nutrition and she will begin laying eggs. So she feeds and she just drops her eggs on the soil. She doesn't have to, to push them into the ground or do anything hard. She can just drop eggs wherever. And we're looking at anywhere from a thousand to 1500 eggs is the capability of each female um, pea leaf weevil. Those eggs will hatch and the, lar the larvae then burrow into the ground and go into the um, nodules that are producing the nitrogen for your plant. And that's where they will do their development. They'll come out, pupate, and then in July, um, they, they emerge from the pupil cases and will come out and now they're looking for peas to eat again. And they look for the peas in the pea field that aren't quite, aren't quite uh, ready to combine. And so the spot around the slough, the low spot in the field, that's where you'll find them congregating. They're fattening up and then they're gonna fly over to some alfalfa, whether it's the alfalfa hay or the ditch again and feed there until early September and then they drop into that leaf litter underneath the plants and that's where they'll spend the winter. And here we go again in, in, um, in the following spring, okay? Um, so you can see here we have uh, a set of nodules that's been fed on and, and housed um, some weevil larvae and they've come out and pupated. This is a healthy one um, with no uh, damage at all. There's a little larvae in this particular nodule. And of course this one is healthy because it's still nice and pink. And this is the creature that, this is the larva of the, of the pea leaf weevil um, who does the feeding in the, uh, in the nodules on you. Okay, whoops, sorry. So um, we know that it is pea leaf weevil in your area that's causing the damage to peas because um, I actually did find a adult weevil in, in Bonneville, uh, just north of town on, on the pavement. There was a field there and I stopped one night late before I went to the hotel and evaluated the field. And there was one weevil that I collected and brought home and had, had confirmed. So yes, we know we have, you have pea leaf weevil there, but their levels um, aren't, aren't getting to the point where you have to push a panic button. Um, their FASC Pulse has put out a great uh, uh, six page fact sheet on pea, pea leaf weevil. And it has, it's full of all sorts of really great information. Talks about, you know, the life cycle of the insect, the, the, growing, the days of temperature that it likes to be in your field. Um, Maybe some cultural controls like seeding a little later than the neighbors, um, that kind of stuff. So uh, just do a Google search for on SAS Pulse and, and their webpage will come up with that. And it's a great, great resource for um, 
uh, dealing with pea leaf weevil and its, its, and its damage. Um, and one more thing I should say about pea leaf weevil, when we have growing conditions like we had last year and um, conditions are really dry, this weevil does not do well. And so those populations that we always saw in the south where we recommended you had to do seed treatments um, have, have just declined to the point where farmers there are no longer doing seed treatments because there's not a threat. And it's because the, we, we assume it's because of the dry conditions and the larvae not doing well in the dry soils. And so as I, as I looked at pea leaf weevil feeding damage in, in this year, where I found them last year at high levels, say around the Edmonton area, they, they were still feeding, there was still feeding damage there, but nothing like what we have seen in the past in there. So um, this, this weevil does not survive well that, that feeding damage. They will reproduce very successfully in faba beans if you're growing faba beans. And, um, but it's hard to evaluate, we don't evaluate faba beans for our survey work simply because it's hard to understand whether the feeding damage is from it eating in one, one weevil making a crunch or whether it's several weevils because of the nature of, of faba bean uh, leaves, how they unroll. So we tend not to do that when we focus on peas. The other reason is we, we know peas and the economic threshold and, and things like that. So um, since it's after lunch and I all, any, anybody who likes insects will try and freak people out after lunches or before lunches. I just wanted to talk about some of the um, beneficials that are in our fields helping us out. And in the words of David Attenborough, Sir David Attenborough, it's like if animals with backbones disappeared, there wouldn't be much effect on the world. But if the insects or arthropods disappeared, we'd be in trouble because there'd be nobody there to manage the dung. There'd be nobody, nobody around to uh, deal with the uh, dead body, dead little mice and, and things like that. And so we have all these heroes working for us. And I just wanted to talk for a minute here about uh, Khatija wasp. So, oh, sorry, there was a radio playing in the background. So Khatija wasps live on the inside of that caterpillar and they will um, uh, feed on the inside of that caterpillar until the caterpillar is just about ready to pupate. And then they'll come out and they'll um, start spinning their webs and they'll be a cocoon for probably about 10 days. And then they'll come out, seek another caterpillar and the process starts again. And what was kind of horrifying with this one was that caterpillar is still alive because it got out and walked, got up and walked out of the, my field of my camera. And so um, just know that this sort of stuff is going on and, and they're, they're helping us in ways we just really don't know. Um, to learn more about these beneficial insects, um, the uh, Field Heroes webpage is a great little initiative. And you can see that little uh, publication there, Pests and Predators. That's about an 80 page book of pests and predators in Western Canadian crops. And so you can pick that thing up by just um, signing up and they will mail it to you. And uh, you can have your very own copy. It talks about the parasitoid or the beneficial insect, what it does, who's its host and um, how you can promote it in your fields. And it also talks about you know, um, this is birth of armyworm and this is the sort of parasitoids you're going to see on it. Um, I'm really proud of this initiative because it came out of an Alberta farmer's suggestion. A farmer came to us from Fairview and said, why when I walk into my farm um, chemical dealer uh, shop, I don't see pictures of some of the beneficial insects that are there in my fields and how, what kind of tools can we create? To, to help me understand what's going on in my field better. We took this to a meeting of the uh, Prairie Pest Monitoring Network 
and they came up with this amazing um, resource for you. So you can go here, you can see um, how to sweep videos, you can see what's in my sweep net, all sorts of really inf interesting information and uh, from on, on your beneficials in your garden or in your yard, sorry. And this is evolving. Like there's a new campaign this year coming out with all sorts of wonderful surprises. So it's worth a visit and it's worth uh, bookmarking on your web page. Of course, here's our uh, web page for Alberta. All our Alberta maps are here. There's resources. There's how to get a hold of me. There's um, things like thing insects to be on the lookout for. Some of the invasive species we're watching for. How to be part of uh, the insect surveys. And and here's here's a a little plug. We often welcome farmers giving us pea fields and uh, wheat fields for, for access for our surveys. And so, you know, a farmer could uh, say, I'd like you to survey my wheat field for wheat midge, and we would go out and do that for them. Um, if you gave us 10 fields, we'd only pick one because we have a quota of a certain number of fields in each municipality. And uh, it sure makes our life easier for hunting for peas because especially especially finding pea fields because they're hard to find before there's six nodes. So in you guys' case, I'd contact Lara and, you know, um, they would look at uh, coming out and doing your a survey for you uh, in your field under our auspices. So know that, you know, we may only do five fields in your municipality, but we would sure welcome to do your fields for us. So thank you if you do that. And, and, what we offer in return is you will get the results from your field. And so when I wash the soil for wheat midge, if you've given me a field, you will get the results for that field and you will know whether you need to make a decision whether you use midge tolerant wheat or not. And you will know that in December so you can make those choices in December. So uh, here's the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network's uh, webpage, another great resource talks about, uh, again, about how to sweep and, and things like that, and sort of the insect pests and calendars of when to watch for these things. So another beneficial resource for you. Uh, this is a, a publication that uh, field crop pests of forages and field crops, and really a great thing to have on your, as a resource to see what is uh, you're seeing in your fields what is the pest. Um, again, available to be downloaded onto your tablet or into your computer and uh, in both official languages. And uh, the last one that they've put out, this is the newest um, publication from Ag Canada. And this is on wireworms. And wireworms were always thought to be a problem in, in sort of in the South but they are increasing in their range as time goes by. So it would be a great one for you to have in your collection of materials. Talks about trapping and how to, how to, uh, how to identify these things. And so um, that's sort of it. I can answer some questions. And if I can answer your question, for sure I will get you an answer because um, uh, I know some really smart people. Um, that's my email. I'm better at getting being gotten a hold of via email than I am phone. I, I'm not real good at answering the phone. And that's my um, Twitter handle. And I would welcome you to follow me. You can find out what we're up to, tweet pictures of insects or talk about what surveys we're doing and where we are. And I guess if nothing else from this talk, remember that nothing replaces boots in the field. And just because your neighbor's doing something that spraying for birth armyworm or doing some control measure doesn't necessarily mean you have to. And so it's important to be scouting all the time and knowing what's going on. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, see what's up. Okay, thank you very much, Shelley. Uh, I did see that there was a few questions posted in the chat. If anybody else's questions, please post them and we'll be going through them. Uh, the first one is, can I assume vertical tillage in the fall till soil um, helps get rid of flea beetles and, or that, can that be a solution 
or because you dried it out, your canola will stay in the cotyledon stage. Um, she guess what she's asking is, a, is it a solution for flea beetles um, because they are getting a lot worse? No, tillage won't help you um, because, especially in the field, right? Because they're not in the field. They're, you know, in the spring, they're gonna be under shelter belts in tree groves in, and, and in the long grass in the ditch. So you do your seed treatments and then you have to scout. That, there's, there's no easy way around this one. And um, we, we have no good method either of giving you early warnings because there's no good method of, of monitoring for this one and doing any predictions at all for this beetle. So I hope that answered the question, but as far as I know, the only thing you can do is scout after your seed treatment. Okay, um, the next question is, any comments on a variety like AAC Leroy, which has uh, the midge tolerance? Uh, I'm not sure what, um, I'm not sure what the question is. Like I can't comment on the yield or, or any of that. If you have, if you are living in an area uh, which has midge problems or have forecasted midge problems, then it would seem to be the best thing, one of your best management tools to try the growing the midge tolerant varieties. And, but as for yield and ag agronomics, boy, you got me, I'm a tree girl. So um, this, I'm relatively new to this crop thing, like 10, 12 years. So sorry, but if, uh, I mean, we can try and track down an answer for that one. I guess you did clarify it. Um, like, does does a variety like that that has tolerance um, does it work if you have the midge? Yes, because the tolerance the the midge is still able to uh, be attack the wheat, but the wheat fights back and the midge is not successful. Now know that there's a ten percent midge susceptible wheat in those and, and we have to put that in there so we protect the resistance gene but yeah it would it would seem to be a really good method of uh, managing that problem in your field and that's one of the reasons we give you the results back so fast from our surveys Well, fantastic. I think you got off easy with the question, Shelley. So thank, thank you goodness. so much <laughs> for your presentation. Hey, thank you. Okay. Um, our next speaker is um, Ryan Furtis. Um, he is a farm input market anal analyst for agriculture and forestry at the government of Alberta. Ryan manages a portfolio of projects and economic data and provides information to senior officials. He also analyzes crop market information and distribution of weekly feed crop prices for various regions of Alberta. Ryan has worked with reputable agricultural organizations, including AgriCorps, BASF, and the CWB for nearly 20 years. In addition to his work experience, Ryan holds a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture from the University of Alberta and grew up on a mixed farm near Lloydminster. Ryan will provide a crop market background and perspective to the crop market facing Alberta producers. When not at work, Ryan can be found outside. He enjoys camping and coaching of all types of sports. All right, thank you, Kelly. Um, how about the screen sharing? How is that going on your end there? Perfect. All right. Are you seeing a full screen? Yep. All right, excellent. Okay, well, Thanks for the introduction, Kelly, and I'll get right into the crop market update. I've done a few of these already. Um, I specialize more on the input side of it, but I do work closely with Neil Blue, who is our crop uh, research analyst or crop, uh, crop analyst for the Alberta government. And uh, yeah, he's given me the latest and greatest here to go through. And like I say, I've done it a couple times already. So um, just getting into it here. Is a little slow. Just some macro issues we'll start off with and then get into drill down into the major crops 
in Alberta and specifically Lakeland region. So um, lots of uncertainty and with uncertainty always comes volatility, I guess. So uh, the COVID and related economic factors, um, mostly the related economic factors would be, you know, the quantitative easing that, you know, all governments, you know, across the world have kind of been involved in, I suppose, and just some inflationary uh, pressures that that has taken. And, you know, we've seen some supply disruptions, um, whether that's been logistics or just, uh, you know, lack of, lack of products or, or uh, feedstocks not coming through. So <clears throat> lots of uncertainty or, you know, still adding into the market is the COVID factor, even though that seems to be getting a little bit less relevant, um, you know, with every passing week, uh, especially, you know, as far as the markets are concerned. Um, Politically and trade barrier wise, trade agreement wise, Canada sits fairly good. Um, you know, a lot of that's been done in the past, especially in the trade agreements. Barrier wise, you know, things seem to be going OK, especially for, you know, Canadian exports. Um, and we've benefited from other countries, you know, being, uh, you know, having restrictions with the exception of, you know, China and the canola thing that was way back in two, 2019, I believe. <clears throat> Consumption trends. And world population. So we see the growth um, consumption wise, there's going to be a bit of a trend to, you know, more protein and specifically a little bit more, um, you know, chicken, pork, beef, um, that type of thing, right? So with that becomes, comes a little bit more feed grains, um, demand for feed grains, ethanol and biofuel mandates will roll through those as they have a big in play, impact in, uh, in the US specifically. Um, making up about a third of taking up about a third of their corn consumption. And then we'll just look at, you know, how the Canadian currency is doing relative to, you know, world currencies and of course the U S dollar. And uh, we'll talk a little bit of weather, mostly in the past that I got no forecast for you, but uh, we'll talk, uh, you know, kind of give a bit of a review of what's been going on on the weather. So as I said, um, this is just kind of a look at the S&P 500 of the US. And you know, after that COVID dip, um, we show there, um, things have been on the rise. And a lot of that is, has to do with uh, you know, the, the stimulus that's been in the market, um, you know, billions and billions of dollars. And you know, upwards to 25% of, you know, of all currency has been you know, in this economic stimulus in the last you know, 12 to 18 months. So, you know, even though things are worth a lot, you know, the inputs are all costing um, more and, you know, the margins are tighter or just as tight as they were before. So we're just kind of talking higher dollars in general these days. And that's, you know, subject to some volatility here, you know, in the next couple of weeks, probably with the Russia, Ukraine thing. Um, but in general, the stocks generally do do just fine. Taking a look at Canada. You know, no different. We seen the COVID drop here, bottoming, bottoming out to, you know, almost, you know, 2012 levels, but overall fairly good rise in, uh, in the Toronto Stock Exchange. And a little bit of that is obviously oil dependent recently, but, you know, a lot has to do with the, with the stimulus that's been spent by the governments. So as I discussed, uh, this is the growth in meat production and consumption um, from this is kind of looking forward into to 21 to 2030. So a bit of a 10 year look from the United Nations Food and Organization. And the big gain is where that square comes from, kind of the lower income countries, the lower middle income countries, China, India, a lot of that Asian population where most of the population resides, you know, looking for a little bit more protein in their diet or being able to afford a little bit more protein in their diet. And, you know, a lot of that comes way of chicken, it looks like, but also beef, pork, and I guess some sheep in there as well, too. So um, overall, if you look at the world, it's, you know, it's gaining, but uh, a lot of that is going to be coming from those countries. And then this is just kind of showing, and this is an older slide, but uh, just going into 20, but uh, just showing, you know, China is responsible for a lot of it. This is food imports. This isn't even feedstocks. So, you know, in billions of dollars, uh, you know, that that's unprecedented growth and uh, just showing you that there's strong demand coming out of that Asia, Asia region. 
biofuel production worldwide. So this is going to just 2020 here. So uh, Neil kind of coached me up on this one a little bit, but uh, basically just showing, you know, since 2006, when they were introduced, the biofuel mandate in the U.S. is at 10 to 15 percent, depending on where you're at. You know, we've seen some strong, strong growth in um, biofuel production, which, you know, is basically a floor for a lot of, uh, um, you know, corn prices in the U.S. So <clears throat> a little bit of a drop off last year, and that's a little bit due to demand being off because of COVID, I suppose, um, just um, biofuels tie in quickly with the economy when it comes to driving and gasoline demand. And that's kind of what we're seeing here, pretty volatile, um, but we've seen a pretty good run up in price and the rebound in gasoline has kind of pushed it over that $2 mark, you know, getting into that 250 per gallon mark for our US ethanol price uh, recently. So, you know, good rebound and good economics. Um, a lot of those, uh, production plants will be making money again, um, which they weren't always in the past there, as you can see when prices were lower, um, not a lot of margin in it for them. So um, they'll be enjoying some, uh, some healthier margins here going forward, likely with, uh, with oil prices, you know, at high, high levels and uh, gasoline demand rebounding and, you know, gaining and gaining in demand. Currency wise, um, this is a look at the Canadian dollar uh, March futures. So it's been trending in, you know, around that 78 to 79 cent range. Um, very much still a little bit of the petrodollar we would describe it as. Um, but, uh, you know, coming off of 2014, you know, we were well below that 90 cent mark into the, you know, hopefully get it in around, stick around 80, 80 cents. And a lot has to do with what's going on with the U.S. dollar and other world currencies. Um, Neil's just showing some resistance here at about 84, it looks like. Um, as he says that it's a very chart-driven uh, commodity or very technical analysis. Um, when it comes to the Canadian dollar, you're able to predict what's going on a little bit more with, uh, with some of the lines and graphs that go along with uh, these future charts. And just kind of showing or proving that, you know, W or world crude prices do have an effect on our Canadian dollar. We've kind of lost in this last run up here to, you know, 95 or whatever it is today, likely over 95. But uh, as you can see before then, coming out of the COVID crisis of 2020, it's definitely lockstep with, uh, with WTI prices, Canadian, uh, the Canadian dollar is, that is, and kind of settled out recently here with, uh, with crude oil taking the next leg up here. So be interested to see what Canadian dollar does in the next you know, month or two if uh, oil prices do stay high. And this is just showing a, a US index made up of you know, mainly the Euro, a little bit of uh, yen um, and uh, British money, and then 10% of Canadian dollars as well too, but um, inversely correlated, right? Um, we see the Canadian dollar stronger when all those other currencies are down a little bit um, relative to the US dollar. Um, right now, they're a little bit stronger as the, as the Canadian dollar tries to make up some ground, I suppose, or you know, maybe they'll come off and then that'll be the inverse that we need to, to climb up again. And this is just uh, getting into the weather side of things, just showing some of the, the drought conditions that occurred, you know, in the May, in the spring of last year, um, specifically kind of in that Dakota region, just south of Winnipeg, you can see that had a big, pretty big impact on spring wheat prices um, as they grow a lot of hard red as well in those next, in those areas. Um, leads into this map. Neil just likes to show that, you know, we did have good germination in May um, due to, you know, some solid precipitation. Um, well, not solid, but decent precipitation. Um, but then from June 11th to September 8th, you know, where you're quite a bit low, this doesn't really account for some timely rains or some showers that roll through, but uh, overall just kind of showing the picture that, you know, in the south there, the 25 to 50%, you know, 
quite a bit of the Alberta region covered in that color with some of it, you know, getting less than 25% of normal um, rains throughout the summer. So no surprise there. And this doesn't really have a, you know, a huge impact, I guess, right now. But uh, as of, you know, the most recent map that we show is, is this one ending of January 30th and showing that there's, you know, still drought conditions occurring. We've had good snow, but uh, we'll take some spring snow or some spring rains to, to get everything rejuvenated out there in the, for the crops and get out of this deficit situation for, for rain. <clears throat> All right, getting into the wheat, um, just looking at the world wheat production versus usage. So this is just kind of showing that wheat's such a global commodity. Uh, we have usage, you know, outstriping production for the last couple of years here into 2021. Um, pretty strong production overall, but, uh, you know, the usage, whether that's, you know, feeding feed grains or, you know, feed wheat or the milling wheat has also increased in demand as, you know, represents a protein product so um you know basically you know carving out a little bit of carryover stocks on the production side just due to strong demand and then that's a bit of an impact on world ending wheat stocks which have been trending down for the last couple of years here this goes to 21 so this will kind of take into account this year <clears throat> and it's down but by no means down to 2012 levels or you know 2007 levels by any stretch of the imagination so um still pretty healthy world wheat ending stocks um a lot of that is coming out of that black sea region as well too so that's a bit of an unknown going forward but uh this is what uh you know is shaping up for wheat on the world scale as you can see, U.S. wheat production versus usage is, you know, quite a bit of a difference there. And that's mainly due to U.S. wheat production being down. And that's just farmers having better cropping alternatives down there, whether it pays better to grow, um, you know, corn in something, some territory that traditionally has been growing wheat. But for the last few years, U.S. has been kind of breaking its own record of, you know, the lowest wheat acres planted, you know, in the last such and such years and you were seeing that on the production side despite usage you know staying pretty firm for the last five years here <clears throat> and then that translates into a low u.s wheat ending stock of course um you know drops off pretty hard in 21 that's that's fairly evident from the chart but uh you know some sizable gains downwards in 20 as well as 19 coming off of a high in 2016 there so um, whittling down on the U.S. Uh, ending uh, stocks. Uh, we're seeing Russian wheat production here. So this is into million tons rather than bushels anymore. So pretty strong production out of the Black Sea region. This doesn't necessarily account for anything other than Russia right here. Um, and they're big players on the export market and, you know, have had pretty good production in the last, uh, you know, five to seven years. And this is just showing a uh, world share of wheat exports by country. Um, of course, Russia is now kind of the, the number one exporter on uh, world wheat. Um, Canada is kind of, Canada, the US, Australia, all kind of in around that, you know, 10 to 15% mark um, with Ukraine in at 10, almost 10% 10 as well too. So um, What's going on now and how long that lasts, you know, could have some fairly big repercussions when it comes to wheat, wheat price, wheat exports, wheat production. So um, there could be a little bit of new, a uh, bit of a shift in terms of, you know, where the exports are coming out <clears throat> into the new year or into the new crop. Now this is a, a wheat chart comparing Minneapolis spring wheat. So that's your hard red spring wheat more compared to Kansas City wheat, which is more in line with a CPS wheat, I suppose. So you can see, you know, this is just showing the last, I guess, 12 months here or so. And uh, the drought did play havoc with the spring wheat and it's kind of widened its gap with, uh, with Kansas wheat due to a little bit of stronger protein here and there. Um, Kansas has increased in the last little bit, but I'm sure uh, spring wheat has, or Minneapolis has as well, pushing past the $10 mark. But uh, 
as you can see, um, that's starting to narrow up that gap um, or the difference between those two. Um, the Kansas wheat is kind of more comparable to what you see out of the Black Sea region, whereas, you know, Minneapolis is more comparable to our CWRS, of course, and other high quality wheats across the world. And just a longer term view here for Minneapolis spring wheats, a 15 year um, look at price of wheat futures there. And as you can see, we're at, you know, historically fairly high prices, but, uh, you know, when we go back to 2012, we've seen high prices, you know, for a couple of years going into, you know, early 2011. And of course, um, 2007 leading into 2008, there was the big run up. Um, granted, that was for a very short while, but, um, you know, we're not seeing historically high prices on the wheat side of things, whereas we are seeing it in many other egg commodities recently. And that speaks to its, you know, pretty good supply and demand charts, you know, on a global scale. So just drilling down into Canadian um, wheat acreages. So this is all wheats with the exception of Durham. And the y-axis is a little bit uh, deceiving here as we started 15, but just showing you some of the differences. And uh, we've seen wheat down last year in general, just due to better cropping alternatives for producers to some degree. And uh, um, we expect a little bit less into 21, 22 um, due to cropping alternatives, I suppose. On the production side, um, dropped way off. This is yield related and drought related, I suppose, um, 21, 22. Um, so way off from you know, previous totals of productions for Canadian wheat. <clears throat> and this is where Neil's from. He comes out of Vermillion, so he took a picture. I, he says this is the neighbor's crop, but I'm not too sure. But uh, I don't have to tell you guys how bad the drought was in general, but uh, we do look like it's going to hit, like we're predicting, you know, delivery pace has been really strong, actually. Um, we're at about 8.7 million tons of deliveries. And... Uh, Granted, that's down, but uh, domestic use looks like it's on par with what it has been historically. Um, but our pace is, you know, considering we got half the crop year to go still, um, you know, well on pace to, to hit targets um, that are predicted. So um, good deliveries so far. And, uh, you know, we expect the deliveries to continue to be relatively strong going forward, I suppose. Um, and then this is just the, uh, the forecasted wheat exports for Canada, we're at around 13. And that's why I say we're at about 8.7 delivered right now. So well over halfway there with, you know, approximately half the crop year to go. Um, so we don't see any issues getting to the 13 for the most part, unless, uh, you know, something falls right off. Um, carry out will be a little bit lower again um, than traditionally about half of what it usually is. And uh, that is for all wheats with the exception of Durham, of course. So tight ending stocks in general. And this is uh, Red Spring milling wheat out of Edmonton. So we track prices at, uh, at uh, our station there in Alberta agriculture um, with statistics. And uh, we monitor that price for about five different elevator locations in and around central Alberta. And this is what it's been showing, you know, it, you know, definitely the five year high, no doubt about it. Um, but when we have that longer term look, uh, we're seeing, you know, prices have been keeping up, but they're by no means, you know, unprecedented. Um, and when we compare it to, you know, some big inputs, like I compare it to fertilizer fairly frequently, um, you know, even uh, some smaller inputs such as seed and definitely, you know, the 450 range is, is doing okay. Like uh, that's putting it at about three tons of, three tons of wheat for a ton of urea, you know, approximately speaking. And historically that's about average, you know, going back about 20 years. So just a quick summary on the wheat side of things, world wheat supplies are lower, but not necessarily tight. And that's kind of why the price hasn't gone completely through the roof. Um, Russia increasing their export rec re restrictions, of course, 
Um, there's been some dryness over there as well on their winter wheat acreage. That's the big one for them. Um, Aussies had a big, big crop, but definitely had some quality issues. And, um, you know, so far U.S. U.S. winter wheat area has been dry. And actually they recently had a bit of a frost scare down there as well too. So that could have some repercussion on yield for that U.S. winter wheat area, which is fairly important as well as, you know, this Ukraine thing, as I've alluded to already, definitely supportive of, supportive of U.S. and Canadian prices as uh, the world looks to find, uh, you know, alternatives to, to some of that uh, grain that comes out of that Black uh, Sea region. <clears throat> also, Neil notes that, you know, there's a lot of speculation going on in the markets these days. So when something doesn't really look right, it's usually due to some panic selling from buyers or something like that or speculators and, uh, and gets moving, gets the, gets the prices moving around a little bit unjustified. All right, so looking more, I guess, into the wheat summer, I don't know why he has this uh, um, star like this. But anyways, um, feed wheat, as you guys all know, $11, you know, very strong price here in Alberta and across Western Canada. Um, the inflation factor, you know, it sounds fun to say $11, but we know that, uh, you know, everything else is going up in price and it's just, uh, you know, becomes a little bit frustrating. And you know, high risk at, at some points or just big dollars. And you know, relatively low protein spreads um, this year, despite you know having a high protein crop, um, farmers not necessarily getting paid as much as you know historically they have between you know lower protein or mid-protein wheats compared to higher protein wheats. <clears throat> Into the feed grains here. Um, this is something that I guess we uh, we monitor fairly closely at uh, Alberta Agriculture, um, U.S. ending corn stocks. So this is kind of the residual market on the feed side of things. Um, low or lower, I suppose, but not necessarily historically low. Um, kind of sitting probably about average for the last you know, 22 years here, looking at U.S. corn ending stocks in bushels. Um, but, you know, well off the totals coming off uh, 19 to 2016. So things are, you know, tightening up a little bit on the corn side in the U.S. Um, again, you know, we've seen higher corn prices going back, you know, even just 10 years or 15 years. Um, it's pushing over about $7 today, I think. So we're seeing a little bit of a, an increase there, of course. But, um, you know. Coming off of some of those lows, especially, you know, 2020 to, you know, 2014, trending in, you know, well below the 450 in and around the $4 mark. Um, you know, if it pushes above 650 going forward, that'll be, uh, you know, fairly high priced corn, <clears throat> historically speaking. That has an effect, I guess, on our barley. Um, is there a little bit uh, interchangeable as we're seeing this winter? Um, Canadian barley seeded acreage versus harvested acres. Well, we're seeing a little bit more of a differentiation there this year, and that's just due to more farmers, you know, baling their barley fields for silage or using it as green feed. Um, sorry, baling for green feed, harvesting for silage, and we've seen a little bit that happen a little bit more frequently in 21-22, um, but you know, not uncharacteristic of what goes on here in Canada. Uh, production way off, and this is, you know, 100% yield related, uh, just not getting the, the big yields that we're accustomed to for, you know, Canadian barley producers. And we're well off of, you know, 4 million tons lower than we historically have been, despite, you know, similar acreages. And then this is similar to the, the Canadian wheat movement. We're just looking at barley here and just a bit of a forecast. Um, Deliveries, you know, very strong at the start of the year there. 2.8, we're at 2.8 million tons of deliveries. Um, and last year was only about 3.1 million tons. So a lot of farmers had, you know, feed wheat contracts with the, with the grain companies and, you know, had some early sales, um, you know, right off the combine or into that fall period. So, and uh, up is domestic use, a bit of a head scratcher. We think it's a little bit more malt um and uh yeah we're we're just not too sure where that's all coming from but uh 
it's up sub, sub, substantially for, you know, by our standards. And um, US feed or feed usage is also strong. Um, until recently, the US corn has kind of put a lid on the put on lid on Alberta barley prices and Western Canadian barley prices. But uh, this doesn't account for some of those deliveries direct into feedlots. It's, it's Canadian Grain Commission. So it's everything that's through an elevator. But uh, we're showing, you know, a pretty good pace and, uh, you know, strong, strong movement till the end of the year. We're predicting. What are we predicting? It showed 3.1. So, yeah, we're like we're getting close to that 2.6 that we're expecting. You know, we're about two thirds of the way there for 21, 22. So <clears throat> it seems like exports are clipping along fairly well um, in comparison to prior years. This is, uh, you know, a bit of a shocker here. Not a shocker, but it's, you know, definitely shows a very low carryout. It's almost impossible to get this low um, or you don't see this very often. So, you know, virtually, you know, farmers are getting the message to sweep out the bins and sell their barley. And, uh, you know, that's being told here in the carryover chart um, of about, you know, just over 350,000 ton, 350, tons expected to carry over into the next year. And then this is the Lethbridge feed barley price. Um, this is something that I track every Friday and I do a report for, you know, the Lakeland region as well, kind of lumped in with Vermilion and, you know, definitely been sitting around that $400 range uh, recently for feed barley. It's been very strong, you know, throughout the province. And uh, recently that down little, this little downward tick here is we've seen quite a bit of corn come in and that's kind of displaced a little bit of the barley demand. <clears throat> so just notes on the barley market here, um, prices, you know, will remain high. We expect that to probably carry over into next year as well, just due to this tight um, supply and demand. Um, livestock feed demand is strong, you know, we see that into China, we see that into Saudi, that's where a lot of those early sales are usually made into um, to, keep their, uh, to keep their animals going. And um, US imports, you know, we're seeing, you know, larger than ever corn imports into Western Canada, Southern Alberta specifically, and that's put a cap on our feed barley prices. Um, and yeah, we're uh, taking use of, you know, or making use of being, you know, the next door to the to a large u.s corn crop and that's uh what's been taking place um just recently in the last few months <clears throat> on to oats lesser known uh, the cereals here and just a couple quick slides i'm um, just showing ending stocks again you know historically very very low um for canadian oats um a lot of that has to do with, you know, lower yields and producers taking their oat crops for silage and green feed, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, setting up for, you know, pretty good prices into next year or tight stocks, um, especially of high quality oats, um, you know, extremely strong demand for feed and milling. We see prices from anywhere from $650 a ton to, you know, $500 a ton for feed, right? So the milling is obviously demanding the closer to 650 and uh, the feed is, you know, sometimes below five, but mostly, you know, in and around that, you know, 450 to 550 range, it definitely ranges. <clears throat> we see the, you know, the trends, the oat milk trend is definitely catching on oat cereals and, you know, a lot of the health benefits to oats. So, you know, we expect uh, those trends to continue, but, uh, you know, whether or not they make a huge impact on um, prices, you know, going forward, it'll be interesting, but it definitely doesn't hurt. <clears throat> so, and Neil just kind of provides a, a basic oat price, you know, across Alberta from, you know, seven to nine, it's hard to get good information on oat trades. Peas, um, again, we're seeing, you know, less acreage going, uh, going in in 21, 22. Um, that has a lot to do with, um, you know, I guess cropping alternatives again, um, you know, it's not unprecedented in 2018, 19, we also saw relatively low. We also, you know, have soil borne disease issue that, you know, limits a lot of producers from growing, you know, 
as many uh, pulse crops as they maybe desire, I guess. So, uh, so we're seeing that as, you know, explanation as, you know, why uh, P acreages creep down in 21, 22. Um, a lot of the production, I guess, lower acreage, and then with the reduced yield, of course, <clears throat> resulting in, you know, five-year lows in terms of pea production. Uh, ending stocks, extremely tight. Um, you know, we saw strong demand. It's come off maybe a little bit recently, but in general, you know, feed, feed peas were going, you know, for high price, let alone, you know, high quality uh, or edible peas, I guess. Um, with a lot of that being exported out early in the season. But at the end of the day, you know, not much being carried over in, uh, in Western Canada. And um, yeah, China, you know, of course, the major buyer. Um, fertilizer going forward, you know, will be interesting. We maybe see higher P acres just due to, you know, the, what we're seeing with fertilizer prices. Um, seed might be a bit of an issue in terms of, you know, how much gets seeded in, uh, 22, 23, but, um, you know, no doubt about it. Uh, the, the S and D is tight and the carryover is, you know, virtually non-existent. Uh, and then the, just some, I guess, some current bids here for what we're seeing for yellows and greens, anywhere from 15 to 18 on the feed side, you know, 13 to 15, pretty solid you know, throughout most of the years. So uh, strong, strong prices for the pea market. And just touching on FABAs here, because um, they are, you know, on the feed side, a little bit interchangeable with, uh, with pea or feed peas. Um, acreage, you know, seems to have stalled out. Um, it's actually down a little bit from the most recent, uh, recent acreages and uh, estimated production and around that 40,000 tons. So very small, but you know, it's an option, especially um, for some that have land that's uh, conducive for it. <clears throat> uh oh, I thought I, oh no, we're just showing this lentil carryover as a little bit more context to the pulse market here. And I just wanted to touch on, you know, the extremely small carryover for lentils, um, you know, less than 100,000 bushels, which is, or tons, I should say which is fairly unprecedented. So um, that's, uh, you know, interesting going forward for the pulse market. So ramping up into canola, we'll talk a little bit of soybeans here for a couple of slides and just kind of give a bit of an, a context to, you know, the, the canola market as well as it definitely hinges on what soybeans are doing. In 21, you know, world ending stocks, you know, show a bit of a five-year low there, um, you know, just over 80 million, about 90 million tons. <clears throat> so you know historically historically okay but you know in the last five years um, a little off um, there production wise you know strong production um u.s hasn't really had crop failure in the last few years so um we're seeing you know good production um soybeans you know benefited from a, a favorable weather and uh, conditions down in the u.s this year Ending stocks will be, you know, quite low. Um, well, not necessarily low at all, actually. Um, historically, a little bit higher than average um, at 325 million bushels. Um, but, you know, by no means, you know, 2018, um, you know, we're whittling down a little bit more there. Came off of some low ending stocks last year. So tough to build off of, you know, low stocks. <clears throat> but uh, definitely been lower in the past, you know, 20 years. Um, Neil's just kind of guessing what 22 will be at. And this is just a look at the May futures for soybeans. And, you know, they're pushing pretty hard. Um, they'd be up again today, probably limit to some degree. But, uh, you know, historically, they've been there before going back to 2012 um, into that, you know, 13 era. Um, but, you know, already a little bit higher than the previous highs of 2008. So soybeans, S&Ds, you know, probably fairly good. Um, and, you know, well above the last five years of, you know, less than $10 a bushel. This is basically what makes up the soybean, uh, soy market, I guess. And we'll start off with the meal here and we're showing, you know, strong demand and strong prices for meal, um, in the U S and this is in dollars per ton. So 
just a bit of a 12 month look at, you know, what the meals have been doing or what meals been doing. And that, you know, hinges on a lot of the, the feed stuffs and, you know, egg commodities going up in price in general. So the meal is going to follow as it's got good um, properties for livestock feeding. Um, soy oil futures is kind of the, the one thing that we do correlate with canola quite a bit or canola oil. And, you know, in the last 12 months, it's taken a fairly good run upwards, you know, probably getting closer to that 70, $74 per pound range. So that's historically pretty well, pretty high. Um, and that, you know, makes for a good oil seed complex, which NOLA does benefit from. Here in Canada, uh, we saw strong, you know, seeded acreages in millions of acres. So, you know, 22 and a half million acres seeded last year. Um, up from the last, you know, 1920, 2021, and, you know, by below some of the highs, you know, going back two or three or four years. Production wise, you know, very much got, you know, devastated by the drought or, you know, the low yields, I guess, across Western Canada, canola did, did not, uh, you know, did not uh, do very favorably throughout the drought conditions. And, Production suffered because of that. And that's what we're seeing here at just, you know, just over 12 and a half million tons uh, produced last year. Export wise, um, to date, we're at, you know, we're looking at about a 5.4 million ton exports, which is, uh, you know, about half of what it historically is. And that's, uh, you know, due to sales being tapered back due to just lack of production. Um, and then just kind of at the top there, we show um, last year at this time, we're sitting at about 6.4 million tons. This year, we're sitting at about 3.6 million tons. So looks like 5.4 is going to be fairly attainable in the sense that we've got six months to go and we're almost two thirds there. <clears throat> Same with the crush here, um, predicting around 8 million tons this year uh, for domestic crush. Um, you know, historically it's been closer to 10 in the last couple of years. And again, we think that, you know, getting to eight is fairly, fairly easily. The current pace would likely extend the, or exceed the year end production versus, you know, last year we we're just at about 6 million tons and had, you know, four and a half to go at that point. <laughs> And just showing uh, crop canola stocks at the at the year end here, sort of, you know, definitely unprecedented. Farmers getting the signal to sweep out the bins again and, you know, sell everything they can. Most recently, um, you know, we've seen some of the basis drop off a little bit as well, too, despite, you know, futures ratcheting up. So um, unless more sales get going, um, it looks like, you know, even grain companies and crushers are starting to, you know, to push back a little bit on, you know, some of the, the high, high prices that they've seen. And this is just showing basically an inverted market. If we kind of ignore the November price there, um, July should be ahead of March and May and, and vice versa. So just showing that, you know, the, the signal is to sell now according to the futures. And, uh, you know, if you wait, it looks like, you know, you might lose money, but, uh, just like what we've seen with May and March here, they're pretty much on par with each other recently. So, um, you know, I'm sure once July kind of gets its spot in the limelight, it'll perk up as well too. But uh, just kind of, you know, showing the, the oddity that, uh, you know, the markets are inverse and the signal is to sell now. <clears throat> just looking at a central Alberta crusher versus elevator price here. And this is, uh, you know, with basis and futures, I suppose, or kind of a daily flat price of elevators and crushers. And fortunately for you guys, we survey, you know, more Northern uh, elevator locations. And then of course the crushers would be ADM, Bungie, Cargill. So those are all within uh, striking distance um, for some of the farmers up in Lakeland County or Lakeland country. So, um, Starting to see that spread narrow up a little bit. We've seen, you know, crushers widen the spread out a little bit. Um, and now recently, the grain companies, uh, you know, starting to get maybe a little bit more aggressive with the combination of, uh, you know, crushers, you know, softening their bases. We're not seeing 
you know, an $80 basis for June or May anymore, we're seeing closer to like a $40 basis for some of those months. So, um, you know, taking, you know, some of the extremely, you know, high prices out of the equation. But uh, as Neil said last night, um, $23 triggered for a lot of uh, targets out there on, on wheat. So who the heck cares what the basis is, I would say. If, you know, if you're still, you know, if the futures is doing the job, which it, you know, did last night, um, you know, the prices will hit. <clears throat> and then this is just kind of capturing what I was talking about on the top there is our crusher basis. And then on the bottom is our elevator average basis. And this is for the May contract. So as you can see, crushers have kind of softened their basis recently or decreased it. Um, elevators, you know, have been too, but uh, a little bit more stable and, uh, you know, fixed in a lot of ways. So the canola situation, um, you know, strong oil demand, low supplies, you know, and that's uh, what we've been seeing. Um, well, Canada has benefited from, you know, some of this uh, environmental movement against palm oil, you know, seeing some of those environmental concerns. And even in the EU, you know, they're kind of hamstrung a lot of their producers to growing bigger crops due to, you know, restrictions on pesticides and, uh, and all the rest. So we've been importing a little bit more, which has helped with the demand. You know, they're a high, high value market, Europe is. So benefiting from that. And as well, you know, seemingly, you know, moving on from the China difficulties that we experienced a few years ago with uh, canola. Um, there's just so much demand and, you know, supply is so low that, you know, it's kind of blowing right through a lot of what is required or, you know, a lot of what that situation um, took out of the, the canola price. <clears throat> um, you know, going forward, you know, things seem, future seems bright for canola, especially with the crushing capacity, even though that, you know, they're not here in Alberta, they'll be in Regina. And, you know, that all helps with, you know, keeping canola at home, I guess, and getting it crushed here and, uh, you know, taking advantage of some more export sales. Um, you know, it won't be Saskatchewan canola, it'll be Alberta, you know, just as equal chance as Alberta canola. Um, canola oil has managed to maintain its premium over, you know, some of the other oils, oil products out there. So that's, that's been positive, even with these extremely high prices. And uh, the meal markets are well developed, just like kind of the soy meal markets as well, too. So everyone's looking for canola meal as it's, you know, high in protein. And uh, with this crushing plants will come a little bit more biodiesel demand too so they're kind of hand in hand and starting to see a little bit more more demand there um, going forward with uh, some of these environmental mandates that are be coming in for uh, for fuel and then yeah as i talked about the basis level signal changed that you know maybe sales have you know flattened a little bit um or maybe you know, grain companies have got what they require for the nearby here um, until new sales are being made. So that's kind of what the basis has been telling us most recently. And I'll just quickly touch on flax here. Um, you know, extremely low ending stocks, no surprise there. Um, you know, historically, it's not that much lower than the last few years, but, uh, but uh, fairly fair, favorable situation for flax going forward. Um, as there is some growing in and around the, in and around the area. So yeah, uh, just quickly, um, Neil and myself produce a weekly crop market review. So that's kind of giving you basically an Alberta view, um, you know, on feed markets, uh, but also, you know, uh, wheat prices. We got a couple of pea prices in there, you know, everything under the sun, so to speak, um, futures prices and everything else that comes out on a Friday. And if you're looking for, you know, more information, farm manager from our website will help you out with, you know, some marketing details, financial management and production economics. So we do a, a pretty um, exhaustive um, research on production, cost of production on a yearly basis. And that'll be released here right away. Um, just, you know, you can kind of compare yourself or give yourself some benchmarks for your farm compared to others in Alberta. So with that, um, I'll conclude and, um, you know, I'll, I'll take some questions now, Kelly, if that works for you. For sure. Thank you so much, Ryan. That was great.
Um, I did see a question in the chat. Um, so with what's happening with Russia and Ukraine, um, the 80% Russia portion, where do you think that's going to shift to? Yeah, like whether or not, you know, other kind of Baltic areas can rise or, you know, be able to ship, like is Ukraine going to be able to, you know, export any or say that 18%, it's going to come out of the U.S., I think, in general. U.S. is going to have to, um, you know, they're kind of the residual market in a lot of the wheat side of things. So I think, you know, their percentage will probably increase to, you know, a few percentages and probably be a bit of everybody, um, you know, when you look at those major exporters. But, you know, 18 is a big number. And if, you know, sanctions stay on or, you know, restrictions stay on, um, you know, that'll be a big void to to fill right so uh you know hopefully you know we're able to take advantage of that to some degree in the sense of you know have a big crop this year coming up and uh you know be able to export and you know fill some of those uh fill some of that demand so in with wheat prices what caused that 2008 spike um do you think we might see the 2008 spike again and what would we need to see the spike I think going into that, um, yeah, world wheat production was quite low going into that. So I don't know, I should have that, or I'm pretty sure I've seen that. So we just don't see that um, right now in the sense that uh, um, the production is, you know, fairly well supplied. So just looking at that's US. So here's world wheat ending wheat stock. So going into 2008, you look at 2007, 2006, you know, kind of in that 125 range in terms of million stocks. So, you know, even though demand has gone up or usage is, you know, quite a bit higher these days, um, you know, we had some low production years or world, you know, low ending stocks that year as, as wheat was just, you know, you know, hovering around that four, $4 to $5 mark here in Canada going into some of those 2000, 2008 years, right? So, I can remember wheat hitting, you know, 550 in 2008 and thinking, you know, this was, you know, a big, big deal, right? So, um, so the world's kind of got the message to grow some more wheat, you know, this year with high a commodity pr prices, you know, we're seeing more farmland in production across the globe, right? So everyone's growing as much as they can. That might get restricted a little bit, you know, just because of, you know, high input prices, mainly fertilizer or just being able to get your hands on some fertilizer. Um, you know, that might restrict a little bit of the production, but, I, you know, the $20 thing, it looks good on the chart, but it only lasted for a very short while. Um, you know, we'd rather see something that happens into 2012, 13, where, you know, we've seen a little bit more, you know, persistent or, you know, um, you know, a couple of years of, you know, relatively high prices. So with restrictions easing up and like restaurants reopening and stuff like that, what do you think that will have an impact on the markets? Well, probably mainly your livestock, I think, um, you know, beef has been doing fairly well or, you know, so I'm told. Um, so historically doing fairly well there, I believe, um, you know, I'm not saying, you know, that's trickling down to the, to the cow calf guy or gal or farm in the, in the area. But, uh, just some of that, those higher cuts of meat, um, you know, they had no place to go and, you know, there isn't a huge willingness to pay for it, I guess, you know, you're less apt to eat some of that at home as you will in a restaurant. So a um, little bit stronger demand once that gets ramped up. Um, if you think, you know, getting more events on, more everything on, that's, you know, so much more, you know, hot dogs, and chicken wings, the, everything else, right? So a lot of that has suffered here. Um, and that's going to drag feed prices into the fight as well, like it already has, right? Um, you know, so we're going to be trying to produce more. And that's going to require more feed, which means, you know, the bottom's going to come up, so to speak, on some of these grain prices, you know, even more so. <clears throat> I guess the op opposing side of that is that if Bank of Canada increases its interest rate, it's going to have an impact on people's ability to pay for food. Um, and so do you see that impacting a lot of the markets? I know that like well, there's been talk about like dairy having to maybe like dump product because like people can't afford. Right. Yes. And prices. we've seen 
Yeah, exactly. And they've had to dump price or dump milk or product due to, you know, not being able to ship it or something like that as well, too. So still a loss there. But interest rates, yeah, like kind of a quarter percentage we're kind of forecasting here or, you know, maybe a full percent in a year. Um, that would be fairly aggressive. But, uh, you know, we're not talking. Well, I don't know. Everyone's very indebted these days. So maybe it does have a higher effect. But, uh, um, you know, not major shifts. But, uh, you know, that definitely will affect people's willingness, uh, you know, disposable income will be affected then. So maybe you're less apt to go for restaurants and such, right? Um, but as far as, you know, groceries and such, um, once, you know, supplies kind of stabilize here and hopefully that occurs in 22, 23, um, you know, we can kind of get back to, you know, curbing some of the inflationary pressures that have been kind of been seen and interest rates will help that as well too, right? So it's kind of a, a little bit of a necessary evil, as they say, I guess. But, uh, you know, in March, they're expecting a, a quarter point. So we'll start with that and, you know, see where it goes from there, I guess. Well, great. I don't see any more questions popping up. So I want to thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it's always interesting to see what the markets are doing. <laughs> it has a big All impact right. on what's been going to be growing. So, fantastic. yeah, in general, yeah, I think, you know, pretty good situation for Canadian farmers. Everything looks pretty good out there, right? So, um, you know, hopefully that, you know, continues on. And with the tight, um, you know, ending stocks on just about everything, it puts, you know, the start, you know, gets a, puts it in a good starting point for the, the following crop year, right? So uh, hopefully we can get some timely rains and, uh, you know, produce a, you know, historically good crop and, uh, you know, farmers can benefit. All right. Thank you for your time, Kelly and, and participants you. and uh, have a good afternoon. Thanks. Thank Bye. you too. Um, so our next presenter um, had to actually pre-record his uh, presentation for us just due to the fact that he had a conflict for this afternoon. Um, so our next pr presentation is the Alberta Crop Disease Update uh, with Michael Harding. Uh, he's a crop health insurance lead with the Alberta Agriculture. Uh, he received his PhD in plant pathology from the University of Arizona in 2004 and has worked for Alberta Agriculture and Forestry for the last 15 years. He's worked mainly on surveillance of diseases, applied research diagnostics, and extension for field and horticulture crops. So I will, if you guys have questions for um, Mike's presentation, if you can just email uh, myself or Amanda, uh, we'll get them to, to Mike and then he can uh, reply back that way. So I will share his presentation. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here and, and give a little presentation here on uh, Alberta crop diseases for 2021. My name is Mike Harding and I'm a crop assurance lead and plant pathologist with Alberta Agriculture, Forestry and Rural Economic Development. And I'm going to be doing this presentation. I'd like to acknowledge co-authors that helped provide or collect some of the information I'm going to be presenting today. Dr. Jia Fung, Dr. Steven Strelkoff, Dr. Reem Abukadur, Dr. Shama Chatterton, and Dr. Kelly Turkington. I also need to acknowledge a number of the other folks that were out in fields collecting data that I'm going to be presenting here today. People from um, Alberta Association of Agriculture Fieldmen, Crop Diversification Center South, Crop Diversification Center North and the Alberta Plant Health Lab, other folks at Ag Canada, and Olds College. So here's what I'm going to be trying to present today. Uh, a short introduction about the situation in 2021, and then talk about survey results from our canola disease survey, cereal disease surveys, and pulse disease surveys and finish up talking about some trends that we're seeing here over the last few years. So the first thing I want to mention is that the amount of disease risk that we see year to year depends on the three sides of the disease triangle, a susceptible host, a virulent pathogen, and a conducive environment. And so if we have host resistance, it dramatically reduces the amount of disease risk. 
Similarly, if we have a low level of inoculum or a weakly virulent pathogen, it also reduces the amount of disease risk. And finally, if the environment isn't conducive for disease, it also limits the size of the triangle or the amount of disease risk there is. So what did things look like in 2021? Well, in 2021, we had both a reduced risk due to environmental conditions and a reduced risk due to the amount of disease potential or disease inoculum that was present. And this is largely driven by the weather as well. So we didn't have a lot of pathogen inoculum spreading or overwintering, and we didn't have an environment that was conducive for disease. As a result, we saw, generally speaking, lower levels of disease in 2021. Now, having said that, it wasn't that we didn't see diseases. We did, um, but in lots of cases, the especially the disease severity was much reduced. So today I'm gonna to be presenting results from disease assessments that were done from provincial surveys in cereals, canola, and pulses. And I'm gonna be presenting three measures of disease. So the first is prevalence. And we measure this in percent of fields positive for the disease. So if the field has symptoms of the disease, it's a positive. So for example, in this map, the red dots are positive and the green dots are negative. So prevalence would be the red dots divided by the total number of dots multiplied by 100. So it's the number of fields positive, the percent of fields that are positive. I'm also gonna talk about disease incidence and this is the number of plants that are positive. So the percent of plants showing symptoms. So in this photograph, you can see there's one, two, three plants showing sclerotinia stem rot out of about 10 plants that we're seeing in the photo. So about 30% disease incidence. And then finally, I'm gonna be talking about severity. Now severity is not a percent or an absolute uh, number. It's kind of an estimate of disease, uh, how bad the disease gets. And we generally use visual rating scales like the one I'm showing here, where we have a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the amount of disease is um, estimated based on this numbering, this, this ordinate scale. And so <clears throat> this isn't a percentage uh, and it's not absolute. In other words, there's a bit of subjectivity that goes into these estimates, but it gives us a pretty good idea of how severe the disease is. So as you can see, there's a little bit of discoloration on this route but probably not very severe at all. This root can still function, whereas we compare that with a seven, this root is no longer functioning and is dead or very close to dead. So these are the three things I'm gonna be presenting. And we're gonna start with the canola survey. We're gonna talk first about black leg sclerotinia and verticillium, and then we're gonna finish off with club root. So the canola survey that my group leads in the province looks specifically at black leg sclerotinia and verticillium. And this map shows the field locations in 2021 that we visited and evaluated um, for these diseases. And uh, it's a total of 359 fields across the province and it's approximately 1% of canola acres in each county. And then I'll give you the details for the club root survey here in a bit. But first let's talk about these three. So, <clears throat> presenting prevalence, incidence, and severity on this um, dial here. And so for black leg, we can see that there were about 90% of fields that were positive for black leg. That number is quite high, higher than last year, the year, the previous year. And um, a bit of a surprise to us, uh, the incidence was around 20%, which again was a little higher than we would have expected, <clears throat> considering how dry it was in much of Alberta but the severity was extremely low, so less than one. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about this um, in a, at the end when we talk about trends. In our survey, we found about 25% of fields positive for sclerotinia, but the severity was extremely low, meaning that we did see a little bit of evidence of sclerotinia stem rot, but hardly any incidence uh, there were not very many plants positive in, in any given field. 
And the way that we do the survey, we don't collect severity ratings for sclerotinia. Finally, we did not find verticillium in any of the fields that we evaluated in 2021. Okay, so that's the results from the 2021 uh, canola disease survey for black leg sclerotinia and verticillium. Now I wanna talk about uh, club root. So this survey is led by Dr. Steven Strelkoff at the University of Alberta. And we collaborate with him on this survey. So a number of the fields that you saw in the previous slide would also have had club root ratings taken and sent to Dr. Strelkoff. And so in the end, a total of 597 fields were evaluated for club root. Some of those as part of the official survey and some of them uh, reports that come in from counties or other municipalities. So in Dr. Steven Strelkoff's survey, of the, the fields that were done using his protocol, about 17% of them were found positive for club root. 81 of those fields had mild symptoms, 15 of those had moderate, and seven fields had severe symptoms. And then there were a, an additional 191 fields reported from other uh, folks out scouting or inspecting fields for club root for a total of 294 cases uh, reported in 2021. This brings the total number of cases to over 5,000 present in at least 3,398 3, or about 3,400 fields. Um, so the reason that the number of fields is smaller than the number of cases is that um, over the last uh, 16 years that we've been doing the survey, some fields have come up positive in the survey more than once. Because once clubbird is there, it doesn't go away. So. Um, we have at least 3,400 fields positive, and we've detected club root in fields over 5,000 times in the last 16 years. This is the map that uh, Dr. Strelkoff produced for 2021, and it shows the number of cases in each county going from this mild uh, or light yellow color up to the red being the highest number of cases. And so you can see that um, the Edmonton area is where we have the most cases of club root and then radiating out from that we have now about 67% of the counties and municipal districts in Alberta positive for club root. Okay, what about cereals? We're going to move now to cereals. Um, I'm going to show you results from a survey that was done across Alberta uh, that included about 79 fields of wheat. And we evaluated these for fungal leaf spots, stripe rust, bacterial leaf streak, ergot, wheat streak mosaic, smut, and then in barley fields, we evaluated for scald and net blotch. So here's a map here on the right showing where the locations were in the province. About 13 of the, well, 13 of the fields were winter wheat and 66 of them were spring wheat. And for fungal leaf spots, we found that there, the about a little over 90% of the fields had symptoms of fungal leaf spot. And about half the plants that we looked at had symptoms as well. The severity, however, was quite low. So this is on a zero to nine scale, and this represents sort of the percent of total. So if every plant had a nine, it would be 100% uh, on this dial. And so you can see that the severity was relatively low. And, and again, this is probably due to the weather, the environmental conditions in 2021. Stripe rust was not observed in any of the fields that were done in this survey. We had heard that there were potentially some stripe rust uh, reported, but it, we did not confirm that and we didn't find it in any of the fields that we evaluated. And fusarium head blight was present in less than 1% of fields in, in the, the fields that we evaluated in our survey in 2021. So this is a case where disease levels were way down. Now, one exception to this is bacterial leaf streak. So bacterial leaf streak is a bacterial disease in wheat that has um, been gaining some momentum in Southern Alberta, especially under irrigation. And in 2021, we had about 15% of the fields that we evaluated have symptoms of bacterial leaf streak. And again, pretty much all of these were down here in irrigated Southern Alberta, but we are hearing now of fields 
uh, in other areas of the province as well. And we'll talk more about this disease at the end when we talk about trends. Ergot was present in around 5% of fields. We saw smut in around 2% of fields and wheat streak mosaic around 1 or 2% as well. So these diseases can smut and wheat streak mosaic virus kind of hide or hang around at very low levels, but we generally don't see a lot of uh, damage due to these diseases most years. Here are the results from 70 barley fields evaluated for scald and net blotch. About 50% of fields showed symptoms of barley scald, but the severity was less than five. It was probably around two and a half percent total. And net blotch in barley was present in about 25% of fields. And again, the severity quite low. Okay, so the last crop group that I'm gonna present data for are the pulses, and I'm gonna focus specifically on peas and show you the results from a survey looking at root rots, mycosphorella blight, bacterial blight, and sclerotinia in peas. So root rots tend to be really common. We see root rot damage in just about every field that we look at most years. But in 2021, the prevalence fell from close to 100 down to below 90%. Again, presumably the drier conditions um, weren't that conducive for root rot. But as you can see, these diseases are still quite common and you'll see them in most fields that you look at. The incidence of root rot was just over 40% and the severity was about 36, 37% of the maximum amount of disease that, that could be um, observed. So, <clears throat> Overall, these numbers are down slightly from what they would be um, in a year where we have a little bit more moisture or precipitation. Um, but there's still plenty of root rot disease out there in 2021. Mycosphorella blight, however, is way down. So lots of years we have near 100% prevalence for mycosphorella and we're down to about 45% of fields showing symptoms. And the incidence, rather than being around 60 or 70%, was way down to around 20% and very low severity. So mycosphorella was affected um, much more than root rots, and we saw a massive drop in that disease in 2021. And finally, bacterial blight was located at trace levels in about 5% of fields, but really nothing serious. Okay, so that gives you a bit of a snapshot of, of what diseases we observed in those three crop groups, canola, cereals, and, and pulses. Now let's talk about some trends, and um, I want to just finish off talking about one disease that we should probably keep our eye out for uh, in 2022. Okay, so I, I really worry that with the dry conditions that we've been having that have driven fusarium head blight levels down, that we may be forgetting that this disease um, is a real potential risk for us. As soon as we have a July where we get some precipitation during anthesis, um, we're poised to have a lot of fusarium damaged kernels and fusarium head blight in our wheat sample. So back in 2016, we had 35% of the wheat samples submitted to the Canadian Grain Commission testing positive for FDKs or being downgraded due to FDKs. Then we had a couple of drier years and then in 2019 we had a wet season in northern Alberta and a drier season in southern Alberta and we saw high levels of FDKs um, in the north and low levels in the south and that was the first time we'd ever seen this. Usually southern Alberta leads the way with fusarium head blight and in 2019 that was reversed. And then in 2020 and 2021, we had very, very little environmental um, potential for the disease to occur. And so we saw very low levels. I just put this up here to show you that this disease can fluctuate wildly depending on what the weather is. So all it's gonna take is a wet July for this to bounce right back up to about 35% of samples being positive. Uh, so we can't forget about this disease and it's a really difficult one to manage. 
So we need to be aware and watching for it and evaluating risk and, and really doing what we can to mitigate uh, the, the damage that can be caused, mainly due to downgrading. Okay, what about canola? Here's some results. Um, on the vertical axis here, this is disease prevalence. So this is the number of fields positive for the disease. And then on the horizontal axis, this is years. So from 2015 to 2021, and the black line is club root, the red line is black leg, and the green line is sclerotinia. Okay, so club root generally every year we find about 10 to 15% of fields positive for club root in the survey that we do, and this fluctuates a little bit, um, sometimes due to weather. I think sometimes too, just because of the fields, the field selection for the survey, but this generally between 10 and 15% of fields being positive every year. And I think this is going to continue. And as a result, we're going to see more and more fields positive, including fields in, in the Peace region and uh, in Southern Alberta, it's going to continue to spread. Now look at this green line, sclerotinia. This is another disease that fluctuates wildly based on weather. And so you can see here in 2020 and 2021, when it was quite dry over most of the province, we had very low levels of sclerotinia stem rot and low risk for this disease. But all it takes is a wet July or August for that to jump right back up. And so we, we need to just be aware that sclerotinia isn't going away. We're not eradicating it. It just isn't showing up when it's dry, like, we had, like the last two years. Now, black leg is an interesting one. So it's moving around quite a bit as well. And why it jumped up in 2021 is an interesting uh, observation that, uh, to be honest, I don't know the answer for why. I can speculate a little bit. Um, I think that we did, so black leg infections, the one that cause, the kind that cause the basal stem cankers that lead to yield loss and, and premature ripening and lodging, et cetera, they usually get started very early in the season, like around the cotyledon or, you know, first few true leaves. And so during that period of the crop stage, we did get a little moisture across most of the province. And so I think very early in the season, we did have conditions that were conducive for Black Lake to get initiated. Um, and as a result, we saw lots of it at the end of the season. Again, that's just my speculation. I don't have any evidence to really support that. It's just a guess. But the bottom line is we saw a big jump from, you know, we were starting to see this trend of Black Lake to get lower. Um, and then in 2021, we just saw this big jump right back up to the 90%, which is about where we were back in 2016. Okay, now this is canola diseases as well, this graph on the right, except that in the vertical axis, I've got incidence, so the percent of plants that are positive. And I'm just showing black leg and sclerotinia. And so you see the same sort of a trend here that the incidence of these disease, diseases also, you can see sclerotinia fluctuating wildly based on the weather. And for sclerotinia, or for black leg, um, we had this kind of trend towards decreasing disease incidence, and then we popped back up to around 17% of the plants positive in 2021. So in, in my last couple of slides, I'm going to talk about what I think this means. Um, let's move to club root. So this is a graph provided to me by Dr. Strelkoff that shows that in 2003, when we first found club root near Edmonton, there were 12 fields positive. And in 2021, we're up to about 3,400 positive fields. And this line is not leveling off. So we're going to continue to see more and more fields. That's my prediction. We're going to continue to see more and more fields testing positive for club root as it continues to spread. And so if you're fortunate enough to not have club root on your farm, that's great. Uh, I wouldn't assume it's going to stay that way forever. And so there's things that you can do to avoid getting it. And there are things you can do to manage it if it does show up. And so if you, if you haven't found club root symptoms on your farm yet, now is the time to start preparing yourself for what happens when you do find them. Because it does seem to be continuing to spread. We're not slowing it down yet. 
Okay, so for 2022, I already mentioned the concerns for fusarium head blight. <clears throat> we can't forget about this one. And it could be a serious disease in 2022 if we get the, the conducive environmental conditions. Clubbert spread, we just mentioned. I wanted to spend some time talking about blackleg. One of the things we do with the data sets that we collect is we have the we have mapping software that can reach out and look at all of the spots adjacent to it. And whenever there are enough spots with a high disease severity, it creates a hot spot. And so you can see that um, over the years, there are different places in Alberta where hot spots kind of pop up. And this is going to be due to a lot of factors. It's not just one thing that's creating this hot spot. It's going to be things like uh, crop rotation. It's going to be variety selection. You know, have you been growing the same variety in that field for the last three cycles through your rotation? It's going to be things like the weather. Um, so there's a lot of things. It could be things like flea beetle damage and other predisposing factors. So there are, there are a lot of things that can sort of lead to these um, black leg hotspots popping up. But I wanted to just say that we have the genetic resources to really manage black leg if we don't uh, abuse them. And so what I mean by that is if we're growing canola in short rotation situations and using the same varieties each time, each time that we grow canola in those fields, we put a lot of pressure, selection pressure, and we could end up seeing, you know, virulent isolates popping up that could cause, you know, a high level of disease and a lot of economic loss. So avoiding black leg hotspots is a, an important, I think, thing for us to keep in mind here as we move forward. And um, there's a lot more, we could do a whole talk on avoiding uh, black leg, um, but the, I, the, that's not the purpose of this talk. And I, I just wanted to point out what I think are some of the concerns that we need to be thinking about for 2022 and beyond. Now, we sometimes have mild winters. And when we do, we run the risk of things that don't normally overwinter here, being able to survive and show up very early in the season. And so whenever we have mild winters, we always need to worry about stripe rust overwintering or things like wheat streak mosaic um, that uh, normally can't don't survive well here over the winter. So depending on where you are and what kind of a winter you're having, uh, this is a question. Um, now we had so little stripe rust in 2021 that the chance of it overwintering are almost zero because we just didn't have any. Um, but there are other things that can survive. And so overwintering diseases could potentially be a concern based on how mild the winter has been in many parts of Alberta over the last month or two. Okay, finally, the last thing I want to talk about is bacterial leaf streak. So I mentioned that we found this in about 20%, 25% of the fields that we looked at, mainly in irrigated Southern Alberta, but definitely spreading to other parts of the province. And so uh, we've had reports of um, this breaking out um, in the Edmonton area, uh, in the Lloyd Minster area. And, and so it's, it's around. So we, we need to be watching for it. Here's an example of what some of the symptoms look like. And so it's the reason we have to really be vigilant about this and watch for it and understand it better is that because it's a bacterial disease, our fungicides don't work. They're not effective at preventing bacterial leaf streak. And so you need to be able to recognize um, some symptoms or you need to be testing fields that look like they might have bacterial leaf streak. And so you can see these lesions that run um, parallel to the venation of the leaf. And, and sometimes they'll be necrotic tissue or pale tissue, and sometimes they'll even turn orange or golden in color. And if there's a lot of moisture or humidity, they might uh, exude bacteria out onto the surface of the leaf and they'll, they'll have this ooze that'll dry down and look like a shellac. So it'll have a sheen to it. Um, and it can splash up onto the head and cause a gloom blotch as well. And then this is how it infects the seed and it can become seed transmitted. So if you have bacterial leaf streak in your field, 
you shouldn't probably be using that grain as seed for the next year because you could be making the problem a lot worse. Uh, both wheat and barley are hosts for this pathogen. And we don't know enough about it yet, but luckily there are some good people working on this disease, both um, here in Alberta and in Saskatchewan. And we also have a good network of folks in the United States that have had this issue longer than we have that are a bit further ahead in kind of understanding what it is and how to manage it. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of good tools yet to manage this problem. And so it's important to watch for it and keep records. Soon you'll be able to send seed in or grain in to be have it tested for the presence of the pathogen. Um, I, we're, we're either very close to or maybe we're already there. Uh, check with your whoever it is that you have your seed testing done by to find out if they can test samples for bacterial leaf streak if you suspect that this might be an issue in any of your grain or seed. Uh, if you have more questions about it, um, you can Google bacterial leaf streak uh, or Xanthomonas translucens and get information. Uh, there's lots of information in the farm press and there's fact sheets and things available. So there's information out there if you, if you want to get your hands on it. But this is definitely something that is spreading and becoming more common. And it's challenging because we don't really have any good management tools to deal with it. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. I hope it was informative. And if you want more information, I'll just leave this up here for a bit. My email and phone number. And uh, all the best. And good luck with uh, 2022. Okay, like I said before, um, if you have any questions, uh, we can definitely forward them onto Mike and get them answered for you. Um, our last presenter today is Amanda Mathiot. Um, she's worked at Lara since 2016. Uh, she first started as a summer field tech um, while she was going to college at Lakeland College. Uh, she's since become the cropping program manager at Lara. Um, so she's just going to give you a little bit of a highlight of what we are working on for 2022 and things that you will see at our field days and what you can come and look forward to. So I'll pass it over to her. You can see my screen, right, Kelly? Yep. Perfect. Um, so yeah, as Kelly said, I'm Amanda Mathiet. I'm the cropping program manager here at Lara. So today I'm gonna to talk to you guys about some of the trials that we are doing in 2022. So today I'm gonna to highlight five of our um, CAP projects or CAP trials that we will be conducting in 2022. So the first one that we will be going over is the assessment of ESN on productivity and grain quality of wheat and barley. So ESN is environmentally smart nitrogen. So it is um, urea that is encapsulated in a polymer coat. So it needs environmental conditions to activate it. So we need moisture that inhibits the polymer coat and it creates a liquid solution and then it makes it readily available for the plants when it's needed. So what we're um, looking at is how different blends of ESN affects the yield and quality of barley and wheat, as well as the protein content of wheat. So we have five different checks, so, uh, or five different treatments, I should say. So the first treatment is the check. So this treatment has just, um, your basic fertilizer blend. There is no ESN applied um, to this actual treatment. Um, it's the treatment that we compare all the other uh, varieties or treatments to. Um, so to create that check, we send in a soil analysis and um, we give it to Top Grow Agro, who has been very kind over the last couple of years to create our ESN blends for us. So they donate all the fertilizer for this trial. So what we look at is how the effects of having different blends, such as a 30% um, total N fertilizer of ESN, 50%, 70%, and 90% have an agronomic effect on the wheat and barley. So 
that is basically what we're looking at within this trial. The next trial that we are conducting in 2022 is the impact of top dressing on the agronomic performance of spring wheat. So we are top dressing um, liquid nitrogen at different stages and uh, varying um, rates. And we're looking at how it affects the yield, protein contents and grade of the wheat. So we um, spray different rates at the three to five leaf. So we'll spray at five gallons per acre, 10 gallons per acre, 15 gallons per acre and 20 gallons per acre. And then we also will spray at the flag leaf, flower and milk stage, 10 gallons per acre. So what we're looking at is how top dressing at different stages can affect the yield and protein quality of um, the wheat. So that's basically what we're looking for within this trial. The next one that we will be looking at in 2022 is, um, is the impact of soil pH, um, the impact of soil pH greater or equal to 7.2 on crop yields. So this has three different trials within the project. Um, so we have trials on wheat, yellow peas and canola. Um, this trial is actually getting done in Fort Kent as well as Westlock with Gateway Research Organization. So um, Graymont has kindly donated the lime for this trial. So we are liming using hydrated lime and zero grind limestone to change the pH to 7.2. Um, within the project, Lara is looking mainly at how increasing the soil pH to 7.2 affects the agronomic performance of these crops. Um, so how it affects the yield, the protein, the oil content. content. Um, so it's, it's very interesting to see how um, these varying rates affect those plants. GROW is also looking at it, um, the same content or data, I guess, um, at how it affects the performance of these crops, but they're also looking at it from a club root perspective um, because Lara does not perform any trials on club root um, land. They're doing that portion of the trial for us. The next one that we are looking at um, is the evaluation of interaction between seed size and depth on canola establishment and yield. So there are three um, research associations doing this, Battle River Research Organization, Smoky Applied Research Association, and LARA. Um, we're doing this project all together. Um, so basically we're looking at different thousand kernel weights of seed and, plant or, and seeding them at different different depths. So what we have is we have three different categories for seed size. So we have um, 2.0 to 3.0 thousand kernel weight, 4.0 to 6, 4.6 thousand kernel weight, and 4.9 to 5.7 thousand kernel weight. So these are all seeded at um, different depths. So we seed at one centimeter, 2.5 centimeter and four centimeters. So we're looking at how um, the establishment of this canola is affected as well as the yield. So we take plant counts on day seven, 14 and 21 after seeding just to see what the establishment is as well as we collect a bunch of data um, from harvest to evaluate how the yield was from uh, these treatments. So we're looking at that as well. And the final one I'm going to cover today is the yield and quality of annual crop mixtures and alternative annual crops and forages in Alberta. So this one um, is very big in the sense that there are eight other research, research associations conducting this trial alongside us. Um, so we are looking at how winter and spring cereal mixes um, work. Um, so we have some plots that have winter wheat, triticale, and I believe fall rye, as well as we have um, plots that just have your common varieties of cereals such as wheat, barley, and triticale. Um, so we look at how these crops work together mixed as well as they do on their own. So um, when it comes to silaging, we take yield data as well as we will send away samples for um, quality analysis for nutrition so we can um, know how nutritious the feed is for livestock. 
We also within this trial have an alternatives portion. So we're looking at cover crops. So if you can look at the screen, you can see there's a picture that says plantains. So what we're doing is we're looking at each individual cover crop on their own. Um, and we're doing the same thing as the winter spring cereal. We'll collect the yield data off of it and the nutritional quality as well. Um, and then our third one is our pulse and cereal mix. So this one's pretty cool. Um, we have been doing pea cereal mixes for a while at Lara, but um, last year and this year there have there um, is faba beans that have been added. So it's pretty cool to see um, what the yield and quality of this feed is going to be. So um, yeah, we have mixed plots with those as well as individual plots of each um, variety. So that's basically the um, trials that I'm going to cover. Of course, at LARA, we are doing many more trials. We will be doing our RVTs, um, the LARA RVT, and we are looking forward to putting in some sort of hemp demonstration or trial. Um, but we are always looking for new innovative things to do. So if there's anything you are interested in looking at, whether it's on the forage side or the cropping side, please get a hold of us and we will try and do our best as we are here for the producers. So if there's anything you guys wanna learn or wanna see in our trials, please let us know. Um, so on the screen, I have my email as well as my work cell numbers. So if you guys wanna chat about varieties or trials, um, just give me a call or email me. And that is everything. Thank you so much. Uh, does anybody have any questions? They can just put them in the chat fast. Um, otherwise, I want to thank our speakers today, as well as everybody who attended. Um, I hope this helps you prepare for the upcoming growing season. Um, and we hope to see you out at all our field days, as well as our extension events that we're going to be having this year. So thank you again. Um, I guess I want to quickly add, we did choose our field days already. Um, we chose them not very long ago. So I'll share those dates with you guys. So if you do want to come and see these trials in person, we do have these trials in um, spread across through our four municipalities. So the MD of Bonneville, Lac La Biche County, St. Paul County and Smoky Lake County. So um, I'll just give you guys those dates. So the Fort Kent field day will be July 21st. Our Lac La Biche field day will be July 27th. Our St. Paul field day will be August 4th. And our Smoky Lake field day will be August 11th. So as we get closer to those dates, um, we will definitely be putting posters out and letting everyone know the times to register. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to end the webinar here. So again, thank you for attending as well as thank you for our speakers for providing excellent information. So. Have a happy uh, 2022 growing season. Uh, we hope that the the weather is much better and then goes into the into the landscape and that we have a little bit of a wetter spring than last year for sure. So thank you very much.